Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this dialogue on such a crucial topic, uh, Europe and its future. Uh, I'm here just to say uh, thank you to Editorial Debate and uh, Miguel Aguilar. Thank you so much. Uh, we have joined forces, uh, the Harvard Club of, of Spain, the European Council on Foreign Relations, and Aspen Institute of Spain to produce this uh, wonderful event. I happen to be a member of the three institutions, but that, that's just a happy coincidence. And since Harvard graduates were so confident, our moderator and presenter today is a Yale graduate, Romana Sadurska, who is a member of the Board of Trustees of Aspen Institute of España. Thank you so much, Ivan Krastev, uh, co-author of this very provoking book. Thank you, Nacho Torreblanca, a very dear friend, director of the European Council on Foreign Relations, uh, also uh, an acclaimed author. And thank you all. Let's enjoy the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this debate, because uh, Ivan told us um, he would prefer a conversation rather than a presentation. Uh, so we are going to, to talk about his book and around his book. I'm Romana Sadurska, and this is Ivan uh, Krastev. As you know, he is the chair of the um, Center for Liberal Strategies. After this book, I thought illiberal strategies, but liberal strategies in uh, Sofia, and permanent fellow of the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. He's also author of another provocative and brilliant book, After Europe. I recommend everyone to read both books uh, to get really the picture of where we are today in the world. And Ignacio Torreblanca, another person who doesn't int uh, need introduction, as you know, is the full professor of La UNED. Uh, he is also the columnist for El Mundo, and uh, for 10 years, I was starting the reading El País, looking for his column. <laughs> so uh, he also wrote some brilliant books, and we are really very privileged to be here uh, today and to listen to both of them talking about this book. There is um, the third person somewhere there, uh, and this is Christopher Holmes. Stephen who is, uh, sorry, Stephen um, Holmes. He is the co-author of uh, The Light That Failed, and of course, uh, some of the ideas that we will be discussing today probably can be attributed to him. Um, this is, as I said, a brilliant and provocative book full of a very interesting, mind-opening, and um, well-argued ideas. And I will start, to, to kick off, I will start at the very first phrase of this book. And the very first phrase is, the future was better yesterday. This is the English version. So, you know, when I read that, this is true, I read it in the Spanish uh, version because I didn't have the English. It didn't strike me as, um, as somewhat bizarre proposition. The future was better yesterday, you know? But this is because I was born in Poland. And this is because yesterday, of which we're talking at the beginning of this book, is 1989. So, for people like myself, who were born in Central and Eastern Europe, just to, for a shortcut, I will say Eastern Europe from now on, you know, for, for us, the fall of the Berlin Wall was uh, the real dividing line between the past that was grim and, and um, communist and so on, and then the future that had to be bright. So, you know, um, this, this phrase was for me, uh, rang for me so true and so obvious that I didn't stop thinking 
that somewhat it's a bizarre phrase. Now, um, today, where are we? Today we are in this future, and if we believe what Prime Minister of Hungary says, today the future of Europe will be uh, modeled on what we have in Hungary and Poland and probably some other countries. So, my first question to both of you is, what went wrong? So, first, let's reveal a very kind of a small secret. The first sentence, the future was better yesterday, was a remark to something that American Vice President back then in 1990, Dan Quayle, said. Dan Quayle was not famous for intellectual power, <laughs> so he was absolutely the favorite of uh, the stand-up comedians in the US. So once he wanted to say the world will be better tomorrow, but he said the future will be better tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so I decided to go back and said, in fact, the future was better yesterday. Uh, because one of the perspectives when you try to judge what is happening is, we are not so much judging how well we are doing today, we all the time compare with certain type of expectations. And this is very much some of the ruins of our expectations about post-1989 world that we are talking about. By the way, Dan Quayle is also the author of, in my view, the wisest thing being said about the change in 1989, uh, said back then. He said, what we witness today is an irreversible trend towards more democracy and more freedom, but of course this could change. <laughs> uh, and I'm saying this because in a certain way you have this kind mm. of idea of irreversibility that was very much based in the idea of the end of history. So in 1989, we had the feeling that we know how the future of the world is going to look like. And now, nevertheless, that most of our countries, for example, in Eastern Europe are living much better than they have been doing in the case of Bulgaria, probably ever in our history. I do believe it's driven for Poland. Uh, the story is that when you look ahead, you see much more problems than solutions. You basically have the feeling that our expectations about the world has changed. On the other side, just before going to Nacho, we, when we read the book, when we wrote the book with Stephen, and be sure that the most interesting part is him, not me, so you are not the luckiest audience. You are going to be much lucky if he was sitting here. Uh, but we didn't read it as a highly pessimistic book. Because one of our major claims was, yes, we see the end of the liberal hegemony. This is not the end of liberalism. And in a certain way, some of the major advantages of liberalism are there. What we cannot expect anymore, like we expected in 1989, is that in 50 or 100 years, the world is going to be populated by the replicas of the Western democracies. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much for, for the invitation and the opportunity to, to be here to the organizers and to Diario, Fundación Diario Madrid for this, mm -hmm. wonderful, for this wonderful place. And it's also a pleasure to have you as a, as a chair. We've known each other for long, and of course, like everyone else, I'm a, I'm a fan of Johan Krastev. Uh, when his books, his books have become kind of the new Beaujolais <laughs> <laughs> arriving in, into town, right? Uh, when is Ivan next book? You know, and it's and, and all of them are are, are such a are such a great challenge. You know, I was I felt so challenged by after Europe because you provoked all of us professors of European integration with a theory of a disintegration. And we were, you know, we, I've spent the last two years trying to put together the pieces of everything you broke in my course on the political system of the European Union, and I haven't quite managed, and I was, uh, so, so you did quite a good job there in, in putting everything upside down in, in your last book, and I'm afraid this is the case again, <laughs> that, you know, we, we're going to need, or we need these kind of conversations to, to put together the, the pieces. And, I, and I've loved every bit of it, you know, on... On, on why and how you look at, at, at both Central and Eastern Europe, Russia, China, and so on, I think it's very provocative. But my, you know, my, my uneasy comment with all of this is, again, in terms of the repetition. History is back as, a, as an imitation, repetition, as a farce. Um, my, my one doubt is we've been before through crisis of liberal democracy, even, you know, the first People's Party, the People's Party appeared in the U.S. elections in 1896 as a result of the first wave of globalization 
going wrong and, and so on. Then we had another wave of globalization and another wave of populism. Um, and now it seems we're having another wave of you know, glo globalization going too far and another wave of populism coming in and so on. So, so maybe this is stretching the thing too much, but in the, in the belief or at least in the secret hope that there would be a method to the madness <laughs> of, of history, even if this, all this crisis has been different. And I would like to think that there is kind of, we've been there before, before we've learned we're going to do better this time, kind of a Steven Pinker argument about enlightenment and our better minds taking better care of mm -hmm. us. Or, but sometimes, you know, I think this is kind of bullshit, you know, it's like, it's gone wrong and it's going to go worse and, and nothing, and we are without guides because societies are now different. You know, the cleavages which structure liberal democracies, left, right, capital, labor, all these things have disappeared. So we are into uncharted territories and forget about all this crap about uh, the past, you know, so... Can you make my uneasiness <laughs> more uneasy? Is, or is my uneasiness? <laughs> or is my uneasiness or? Uh, no, just for those uh, who have not read the book. The book has, to be honest, a very simple point. And the point is that if you go back to Fukuyama's uh, The End of History, and The End of History is not this ridiculous text that people are talking about. He was touched on something that was very real. Uh, the basic problem, and by the way, the, the article was written in April 1989. In April 1989, nobody expected Soviet Union to collapse. By the way, till December 1990, the top American specialist on Soviet Union was sure that the Union will remain. 19, in April 1989, there was no Tiananmen, and in a certain way, China was the kind of top reformer and performer. So he basically said, communist ideology is over. As a result of it, even if the states are going to stay in the way they stayed in China, what is going to happen is that the end of history means there is only one model that people is worth imitating. And this is the model of Western democracy because democracy has become the synonymous with modernity. It does not mean that all of them are going to become like the United States. By the way, he didn't believe that everybody is going to succeed. But his idea was some are going to imitate and succeed. Others are going to imitate and fail. Third are going to fake. But there is only one model. And I do believe he touched on something that is very real. Uh, there was a certain type of uh, relations between modernity and democracy in which individualization and basically discovering new opportunities and making people much more aware of their rights, of their desires. What we do in the book is clashing the intuition of uh, uh, Frank Fukuyama that basically the world is going to be populated between uh, models and their uh, replicas with uh, the intuition and, in my view, the revelation of an interesting French philosopher, René Girard, who was totally obsessed with the idea of mimesis and imitation, but his intuition was different than Fukuyama. He said the relations between the model and the copy are antagonistic relations. The imitated is, has a very kind of a painful relations with the model that he or she imitates because first, if I want to imitate you, it means that I recognize that you are better than me. Secondly, if I imitate you, I want to be on your place. I want to replace you. Uh, and as a result of it, when I was, we were doing this book, we looked around and said, where the, uh, the right-wing populists in Central and Eastern Europe are wrong, and to be honest, also dishonest, is when they start to talk about transition as the colonization of the West, uh, uh, of the East by, by the, West. the West. This is not true. This is simply not true because in 1989, it was East Europeans who said, we want to be like the West. The idea of normality was the most important word in uh, all the transition which started after 1989 to the extent, and this was uh, what I learned in, uh, in Berlin just back yesterday, uh, they have... Uh, basically preserved the notes 
which the leader of the, uh, the Politburo of the German uh, Communist Party has been taking during this famous press conference in which he announced unexpectedly the opening of the wall. And he was taking notes, there was not even sentences. Four times, the only basically word that you can clearly read was normality. We are going to bring everything to normality. And normality means the West. And the idea was that we are going to imitate the West. And it was our decision. So from this point of view, this was not the colonization story which they're saying because this was not that the West came and said, do it. By the way, the West was not insisting our countries to join the European Union. It was our countries insisting to join. But where some of the populist leaders were right is to understand that relations between the copy and the model are going to be antagonistic relations. <laughs> At some point, the major message coming from uh, Mr. Uh, uh, basically Orban or uh, Mr. Kaczynski is, we don't want to imitate you anymore. We want to be ourselves. Mm -hmm. And this is an important message. And I was, uh, the, the only kind of a very short thing that I want to tell you is that when we go in the book, we're also saying that this kind of a drama of the imitation has a very different story in Eastern Europe, where basically East European countries wanted to be like the West. It has in Russia, totally different story, and we're going to talk about this. And paradoxically, at the end of the post-Cold War period, suddenly they imitated the model. The United States said, we are the biggest victim of the world that has been imitating us. So this is why we try to bring basically these three stories together, and we have a short uh, uh, chapter on China, which was a huge challenge for us, none of us is specialists on China. This book started as a book on Russia. Uh, both of us have been doing Russia for a long time, we have been doing Russia together. Uh, my joke is that probably I have spent more time with uh, senior Russian officials than the Trump campaign. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> from, from this point. But China was important for us because during these 30 years, China was not part of the age of imitation. They borrowed, and to be honest, they have been stealing technology, institutions, but they're always insisting that everything is with the Chinese characteristics. We don't want to be like you. We are going to be ourselves. And this kind of, to the extent that there was this uh, beautiful story which a colleague of ours, Mark Leonard, was uh, uh, telling in this book on China, there is this very famous kind of symbolic story in China about two villages. One village has been cultivating the land with horses, the other with zebras. Over time, it appeared that the zebras are doing better than horses. So what the mayor of the village of horses did? One night, he asked some of his aides to paint their horses as if they're zebras. So they said, suddenly, what happened? Our horses has to have these paints. And then he started replacing horses with zebras, but continuing to insist that they're cultivating the land with horses. And I do believe this gives a good story about the Chinese transition, because even when they have been coming with a capitalistic economy, when they're doing this and that, they were insisting on the communist nature of their power. So this is why these four stories were trying, at least in our ambition, to tell you not to talk and say, okay, they are authoritarian, so this populism and so on. Our claim was that there is something in the structure and the nature of the post-Cold War world, which was based on the existence of one model only, and that created this type of a clash, which does not come from any alternative. I don't believe that any of these people come with any alternative to the liberal order, mm -hmm. but which managed to mobilize support very much also based on the psychological experience of living in the world, which the imitation imperative is running. In the book, you make um, an argument as far as Russia and uh, Central and Eastern Europe is concerned, that um, the backlash was the result of, of a certain feeling of humiliation on the part of the imitators. Yeah. Um, and this humiliation uh, produced all these results that are so uh, noxious today. No? Uh, so, my question would be, um, is there... 
you know, this is not uh, um, in, in, in Eastern Europe. We have some countries that do not succumb to to populism. You have the Czech Republic. Well, it's still on the track. Yeah. Uh, Slovakia, Estonia. Or you think this is no, no, a no, general? No, no, no. This it depends to whom you speak. Yeah. If you speak about these three hundred thousand people that have been in the street protesting against Babich. Yeah. Uh, that, because it's a psychological feeling, I totally mm -hmm. agree. I don't believe that Babich has much in common with Orban or Kaczynski, but mm -hmm. I always believe that all these people are very different. By the way, mm -hmm. between Kaczynski and Orban, there are major differences. Yeah. Major differences. We are not talking about one and the same type of, of regime, course. but what they share is certain sentiment. Mm -hmm. They share the sentiment of humiliation. That's what you second stress. Second class not citizen. Second class citizen, yeah. And, uh, and they, want, they don't want to be any longer imitators. But you know, there are many people in Eastern Europe, I still believe, that do believe in uh, liberal values, and they uh, wage a rather heroic uh, resistance. You know, you look at Poland, you, look at, you have free press there, you have free television, uh, you have uh, civic associations and so on. So there are still millions of people who, who believe in this idea, and I'm sure this is the case in Bulgaria, sure. this is the case in, in, uh, all over the, the Central and Eastern Europe. Do you draw any uh, comfort from that, that they can prevail one day, that we may have... You say demography is the destiny, no? So if you look at the young generation, this young generation of millennials, they were not, they were not born uh, you know, with the complex of inferiority towards the West. You know, they, uh, they just look at the guys from uh, Germany or France as neighbors who have very similar problems, you know, unemployment uh, and whatever. So um, maybe this demographical change, if we keep on preserving the values in institutions, civic society, free media and so on, maybe we have a ground for, for some hope in the near future. No, but I have a hope, but my hope is coming yeah. from slightly different places. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a new generation of liberals, and this liberalism is not going to be based on imitating the West, it's going to be based on the reaction and backlash against the populist governments themselves. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Slovakia is the greatest example of this. What mm -hmm. is important about the new Slovak president that was recently elected, first of all, she's more liberal than the society is. If you read basically the social attitudes of the Slovak society, you never can basically imagine that this person could be elected. She's also not an English speaker. Yeah. And this is quite interesting because her liberalism was very much based on the things that she didn't like in mm -hmm. the way the country was governed in the last 10 years. So this is different than the liberalism of the 1990s in which in Bulgaria it was enough to say about certain law it exists in Italy or Spain and Netherlands and people are not going to discuss it at all. The very fact that basically in the Western countries you have this piece of legislation mm -hmm. was enough for this to be adopted. Talking about demography, there is one thing that was totally missed in the analysis of the transition and I try to make this argument in the previous book, and I do believe we deepened it here. Central and Eastern Europe, like most of Europe, has a major demographic problem. So basically, you have a societies that are aging with a very low birth rates. But the major difference between many of other European countries and East European countries is also that Eastern Europe has a very high out-migration rate. Eastern Europe has lost 6% of its population for the last 30 years. And if you see the demographic projections, my own country, Bulgaria, in percentage terms, is the fastest shrinking country ever in modern history in the absence of war and famine. Bulgaria used to have 9 million people living in the country in 1989. It has 7 million now, and according to the UN projections, by 2040, they're going to be 5.7. Why I'm saying this? Because part of this kind of a sense of loss, even in a societies that are doing incredibly well in economic terms. For example, Poland, from this point of view, is incredible. For the last 30 years, the GDP of Poland tripled. 
you have 73% of the Poles today who declare that they're satisfied with their personal lives. I can imagine that French, Italians, and Spaniards can envy Poland on this. But the idea of individual success is not translating into the idea of the collective success. And one of the reasons is very much demography related. Because it's not simply, just give you uh, three or four figures to imagine what the, the scale I'm talking about. Between 2007 and 2017, 3.4 million Romanians has left Romania. 70% of them younger than 40. We are talking about a country of 20 million people. So, when people were saying why East Europeans were so hostile, and we, were, we have been hostile to the refugees in the way which was, to be honest, even aesthetically difficult to watch, uh, particularly keeping in mind that in our countries we have more anti-migrant parties than migrants, because I can imagine basically some countries like Italy or Greece, where there is a real issue, there is a lot of people there. You should understand that the reaction was much more the response of the trauma of the people that have left. And the people that have left in this type of an aging societies creates a huge group of population that feels totally abundant. There is the fear of ethnic disappearance. Most of the Central European nations, probably with the exception of Poland, are very small ethnic groups. And they never have been sure are they going to survive. Even in Poland, if you see the Poland anthem, it starts, Poland has not died yet. Can you imagine? Pors <laughs> yes, Pors yeah, 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 but this is the end of the uh, 18th century. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I agree totally. Yeah. But can you imagine the French or the Brits yeah. starting exactly. their anthem? They take their states for granted. None of us is taking this for granted. And from this point of view, you see all these old Bulgarians living outside of the big cities, which try to imagine the future in which their kids are not there, their doctors are not there. 10,000 doctors have left Romania in the last three years. And this is why the future is something that they fear. And to be honest, this is a general European feeling. There was a big survey being done by the Bertelsmann Foundation in the summer of 2018 67% of Europeans claimed that the life was better before. When before? When we were young. Uh, but 77% uh, but of Italians. So strangely enough, you have a societies that are nostalgic mm -hmm. about their past and fear their future. And one of the things that colleagues have been immediately uh, demonstrated, there is a very strong correlation between voting for the far right and the level of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. In a certain way, basically, the past is becoming the future that we are losing. So talking about the pessimism and about apocalyptic views, strangely enough, the two most powerful political movements that you're going to see on the streets of Europe, right-wing populist and the Greens, both of them are apocalyptic in a different way. The populist said migrants are destroying our way of life. The Greens are saying basically the governments are destroying life. So from this point of view, there is not excessive optimism, even outside of my book. Okay. <laughs> Nacho, I would like to ask you, because you know, th this is a very plausible explanation of anti, um, let's say, immigration, immigration mm -hmm. uh, feelings in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. What about Spain? Well, I mean, the, 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 the thing which makes the book uh, very interesting in its translation to Spanish, not only in the language, but in kind of the understanding and, and the views of the world, is that there are many parallelisms um, in the way Spain is also a latecomer mm -hmm. uh, to European integration, a latecomer to industrialization, uh, a country which built all its modern identity into, uh, around the concept of Europeanization. You know, yeah. Spain is the problem, Europe is the solution. Yeah. Europe is a solution to Spain's historical problems. And all these feelings of inferiority vis-a-vis, -vis, we're not like them, they don't accept us. Africa begins at the Pyrenees. Um, there are two souls in this country. There's an authentic uh, soul going back to empire and the essence of what Castilian 
views of the world, and then there is the modern enlightened. So there are many stories there, you know. My, my hypothesis then on, on why things are different here as compared to, because these two stories at some point they completely, they, you know, they run in parallel, yeah. but at some point they completely derail and mm -hmm. you end up in Central and Eastern Europe, which for us was most, more Western than us, you know. Yeah. Central and Eastern Europe had a longer history of probably civil society and democracy in the interwar periods and probably you know, e even Turkey was more Western than Spain at some periods of time under Franco and so on, right? So the, the two things which help, or, or the one thing which help is precisely on this is nationalism is a discredited idea here. There are, there are three nationalisms in this country and none of them has done well. Spanish nationalism, kind of Castilian one, you know, Catalan nationalism, Basque nationalism. No, nationalism is a bad idea and has proven wrong every time you've tried to build a nation around kind of that kind of nationalism, whereas in Central and Eastern Europe, nationalism and the, this idea was still valid precisely because it helped you liberate from occupation. So this is the one thing in which our paths go, uh, go totally different. Because on immigration, if it was just for immigration and immigration, the paradox is that, you know, you are... A, not you, but you know, Poland and Hungary are populist countries with a lot of growth and no immigrants. So you know, yeah. you you should have expected Spain with low growth, young people going to London to work at Costa yeah. Cafe, and 14% of of immigrants, six million of immigrants, to have a populist right. I mean, all the odds were there for that, but it was not because nationalism is is the thing. Which, which, does, which does not allow you to glue all these things together. And when you have it, it's Vox, and it's basically anti-Catalan, it's not anti-immigrant, even if they try to play that. This role, is right? a very important point, because one of the major problems for East Europeans, because for us, the model was Germany. Yeah, we for many, like Germany. Yeah, you know. For many reasons, because Germany has a very successful transition, it became very rich, but also it closes to us. Uh, in a certain way, when uh, basically East Europeans, particularly Poles, Hungarians, when they talk Europe, they imagine Germany. But there were three things about imitating Germany was very difficult for East Europeans. And the first is the nationalism issue. In 1945, nationalism was totally discredited and defeated in Germany. And the Nazis was very exceptional. In 1989, nationalism was part of the victorious coalition against communism. There was a very strong nationalistic uh, part of solidarity movement. Uh, to be honest, Mr. Kaczynski, in many respects, resembles very much Mr. Corbyn. They didn't change their views for the last 40 years. Uh, and, uh, and I'm, there is no irony. Uh, I'm saying ironically, but also with respect. So this is where they are. If you, the interesting question about Eastern Europe is not why nationalism return, but where it had been hiding for 15 years. And here the problem is first the Yugoslav Wars, which shows the bloody face of nationalism. But secondly, in 1990s nationalism in Eastern Europe was very much connected to the ex-communists. Mr. Milosevic was not coming from solidarity movement. So for people like Mr. Kaczynski, this kind of a discourse was problematic for disassociation. But after the country sent the European Union and so on, it worked. And the second thing which was very difficult to imitate was that, uh, and this is very strongly to be seen in East Germany, is the Germans were saying, we did it very well, but we ask you to imitate not what we did, but what we should have done. For, and by the way, I, I, find the moral, uh, I, I find it morally uh, absolutely legitimate, this argument. Between 1949 and 1968, there was not much coping with the past in West Germany. And the generation of 1968 was the one that asked this question. So when after 1989, immediately, the West Germans said, it's time to cope with the communist past in GDR, the reaction of East Germans was, you are doing to us what you didn't do to yourself. You didn't give us these 20 years of amnesia. 
Why are you asking these questions? Why are you basically not allowing our professors to stay in school and to teach, while at the same time the Nazi professors have been teaching in West Germany in the 50s and 60s? And this created this very strong story of being treated differently. There is a beautiful Hungarian short film by, done by somebody who has nothing to do with uh, populism, but which, in my view, really beautifully captures the world viewed in Europe from the eyes of somebody voting for Mr. Orban or Mr. Kaczynski. The film is the story of a girl. So it's 1990s, it's Budapest, and this girl goes to a new school, and she was very attracted by this new school because she wanted uh, to sing in the school choir, school choir. It was a very famous choir, and she's accepted to uh, be part of the choir, but because she was not trained enough and because there was a competition and the musical teacher very much wanted the choir to win the competition, she was asked for the beginning just to open her mouth and not to speak and not to sing because she was not prepared. So when her friend learned about this, she became totally appalled and starting to talk to others, suddenly her friend understood that she was not the only one that had been asked simply to open her mouth. So the film ends with this kind of a, a very impressive scene in which the competition starts, the musical teacher gives the signal to start singing, and out of solidarity with this girl and the others, everybody is just opening their mouths. And they start singing only when the teacher left. This is the short history of the last 30 years, if basically Mr. Orban was as gifted as this uh, directed to tell what he believes has happened to Eastern Europe. We have been invited to the choir, but we were asked just to open our mouths, but now the time has come, the teacher should leave the room, and you can guess who is the teacher, and then basically we all start singing. Uh, it was not clear what exactly they have been singing, but uh, this, is, <laughs> this was the story. So nationalism point of view, which you are making is critical for Central and Eastern Europe, nationalism not simply was very important, but it was never understood as a major confrontation with liberalism. All these kind of states in the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century came and emerged out of the disintegration of the empires in a coalition between liberals and nationalists. Communism was defeated in a coalition between liberals and, uh, uh, and nationalists. And now it's for the first time where basically liberals and nationalists face each other in Central and Eastern Europe as a kind of a mortal enemies, which was not the case before. By the way, there were many liberals in Poland that who didn't speak any English. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> exactly. But um, this is interesting because uh, I like very much the, the story of this movie. Actually, I like very much all sorts of stories that you tell in the book and the recourse that you have to works of uh, literary works or f movies, because they capture very well the, the spirit of, uh, of these uh, moments that you're describing. No? Um, but, you know, the, the teacher uh, in, this, in this movie is the one that is, uh, that is uh, well, the, the revolt of the children against the teacher. In uh, Eastern Europe, revolt against the European Union. I mean, not the yeah, the, the mentors coming from the West, telling people how to do the transition, how to do this, how to do that. But in Spain, you had a transition. You entered the European Union, then the European Economic Community. You had to make also homework, and there was no backlash of this kind. Uh, would you care to to explain? Is it just uh, uh, social psychology, or is there something to do with the fact that Spain had a transition in uh, political terms, but let's say it was a different economic system. You were not mm. sort of damped yeah. into, yeah. Uh, you know, in the free market and saying, take care of yourself and... Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, we, I think there were two, three things which were crucial, is that there was a past people know what it was about. It was civil war. If you fail to agree, if your democracy fails, it's civil war. 
and then authoritarian regime. So, you know, the mirror is showing something which is very clear. And the future is offering something which is also very clear, which is um, uh, European integration. Then there is social cohesion and, and the way this adaptation to the European Union is done by a government which is compensated losers. And you do amazing things like privatizing, opening up, decentralizing, uh, but you always keep in, try and keeping together society, uh, which I think is, uh, is, is one of the keys uh, to this. Most importantly also, our success uh, was not a geopolitical threat to anyone. <laughs> You know, contrary to that, uh, it was a success of the West, and it was a wave of democratization. So it's not only that you were imitating, um, but, that, but people were honestly kind of embracing you because they felt this was also uh, their success. And, but again, you know, our, in, I, I remember that, you know, that for Spaniards, it, it was so shocking because it took us a lot to accept in the beginning, you know, accession of the new members because we felt that, you know, we're now members but the union is going to move east. It took us kind of a while to accept this, but I think it was a shock in Spain to listen to Vaclav Klaus on May 1st, 2004, addressing the nation, saying, on May 1st, 2004, the Czech Republic has ceased to exist, <laughs> right? Whereas, for us in 1986, it was a triumph. Uh, Britain is a case in point, maybe, that becoming member of the European Union was the ultimate failure of a country because you could not do it on your own and you could not have achieved independence but through the back door of European uh, integration. Uh, so, so, you know, we're more, as you say, you were more Germans in the sense that our defeat, we turned our defeat into a success, uh, but your success was then a defeat. No, no, right? I totally agree with you because all the previous waves of democratization were bringing, democracy was bringing more egalitarian societies. There was these correlations between egalitarianism on the level of incomes and democratization. Because of the nature of the communist regimes, basically, of course, the democratization came with more social inequality because private property reemerge, people start uh, making money, and of course this also creates a different story. The Cold War story is also quite interesting because when we had been writing the book with Stephen, the, the most important things that we realized, because people said where we did something wrong, to be honest I don't know the answer to this question. Because this answer believes that there was one wrong policy or one wrong moment, I don't believe that this is the question. The question was there was one illusion that remained for a long time, and the, re the illusion was that the end of the Cold War means that the East is going to change, but the West is going to remain the same. While basically, now we know to what extent the Cold War type of a liberal democracy was preconditioned on the Cold War. To what extent, for example, the relations between the business and the trade unions in Western Europe during the Cold War was based on the existence of the political system that claims its legitimacy of representing workers. So you should be sure that the workers is going to be on your side if they're going to be the clash with the Soviet Union. So from this point of view, the problem of the age of imitation in the way we're seeing it is that not simply humiliation and resentment coming from the imitators, but it was also that the model became uncritical to itself. When everybody wants to imitate you, you fall in love with yourself. You have the feeling that you're perfect. Everybody wants to be like me. Uh, and then you're losing something that you started in the beginning, capacity for self-correction. And this is why we have a much more dramatic story now and say, can we deal with this or not? I, I believe that the discourse of crisis was always the, crisis, the discourse of democracy. If you read the books about democracy, in 1983, which looking back then we believe that democracy is doing very well and the Soviets were basically doing very badly, the bestseller, I, I'm, I'm sure that there is also a Spanish translation of the book, was Ravel's books, While Democracy Will Perish. And this was a very, very popular book, both in France and the United States, and the idea was, it's obvious, Soviets are winning, we are losing, we are on the uh, 
each to commit a suicide, I mean the West. So from this point of view, the democratic regimes are always lacking self-confidence, always kind of critical, always believing that we are kind of on a losing side. There was a 30 years in which we became so self-confident that in a way the crisis now is much more severe than it was. Just a minor point there that one of the sources of self-esteem when you are imitating, as you point in the book, is that you see that the original uh, uh, you know, does not do that well. Yeah, yeah. That for, for yeah. Spaniards, I mean, I think, in a sense, all these feelings of second class, your democracy being second quality, not being perfect up to it. Then in 2016, you know, you admire so much the Anglo-Saxon world, and you see the Anglo-Saxon world committing suicide uh, by both Brexit and by electing Trump. <laughs> And, and you, but contrary to Central and Eastern Europe, in Spain you will say, we're not that stupid, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is, we can even outperform the original in some senses, you know. Uh, if in it, Eastern Europe is different. <laughs> this is also part of the latecomers problem. There was a study showing that people who are coming to the railway station less than eight minutes before the, their train should go, 20% uh, of them jump on the wrong train. Uh, and from this point of view, the fact that you're imitating, you're investing in the Western model, and after the financial crisis, the question, could it be that we invested in the wrong model, was also something that came big. And from this point of view, this is how China affects our imagination. In Central and Eastern Europe, we don't know much about China. For us, Russia is so big that we don't see anything beyond Russia. Uh, but the big story was, historically, we were told that China should do well, should not do well. Why they're doing well? By the way, now when you see also economic performance of the countries, the other country that is also making us uneasy is Belarus. They should be much worse than they are. Lukashenko used to be the last idiot in Europe, uh, according to Blair. And then suddenly, in economic terms, they're doing fine, and social cohesion, and so on. So this is why, because in Central and Eastern Europe, we had a very strong Marxist training. Nevertheless, where you politically stand, communist, anti-communist, there was a Marxism and Hegelianism, so we were very highly deterministic. And we were promised in the 1989 that we know where history goes. For everybody who was giving exams in Marxism, it is much easier to agree that the end of history is capitalism than to believe that history does not have a final destination. So suddenly there was a question, what about the final destination? Probably in Spain you have been much more artistic and less deterministic, so this is why you are less worried about the model having a problem. <laughs> Well, one of the most interesting parts of your book, and I would like, because we don't have that much time left, uh, to touch upon that, is, is Russia. I find this, uh, I, I recommend everyone to read, if you don't have time to read the whole book, read the chapter on Russia, it's excellent. And you explain the, uh, let's say, the the whole process of imitation in Russia that is not as straightforward as in Eastern Europe. No, listen, of course, Russia is a very interesting case. By the way, you can decide not to read any of the parts. You can decide only to buy the book, even this is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but the story with Russia is, uh, in a certain way, after the end of the Cold War, uh, all the Western leaders did their best to convince Russia that we won against communism together. And if you go in the rhetoric of Bush Sr., if you go basically Clinton, the Helmut Kohl and others, it was there. But for the Russians, it was very difficult to buy this narrative for several important reasons. First, all our countries can claim that communism was the occupation period. Soviets came, they occupied us. And to be honest, it was quite true. Russians could not say this. Nobody occupied them. Secondly, in the 1990s, Russia lost one third of its GDP. The life expectancies in Russia in the 1990s declined seven years. So there was a real misery on the economic side. And then, basically, there was the empire. After the disintegration of the Soviet Union, Russia was a territory bigger than the territory of the current European Union. 25 million Russians left living outside of Russia. So from this point of view, we cannot be surprised that the idea of a victory narrative 
didn't work. And nevertheless, that President Yeltsin was doing his best. Uh, there were two moments in which basically this kind of a victory narrative totally collapsed. On the economic side, it collapsed during the financial crisis of 1998, when basically the first generation of the Russian middle class was destroyed. And secondly, this was during the Kosovo War, the famous turn of a plane of uh, 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 Mr. Primakov, who was then the prime minister, in which the Western game to pretend that Russia still is a superpower was declared ridiculous. So Russia was a country that you don't need to take seriously. And then came Putin, and Putin's story was, we lost. And because we lost, we have the right to revenge. We are going to be back. We are going to be up of our knees. And these two different modes of imitation is, first you understand the first 10 years of this century. Why, if Russia does not believe in democracy, they have all these elections, why they are doing all this? And from the Western point of view, the idea was that they are doing this just to impress us. They are faking democracy in order for us to recognize it. But our interpretation is slightly different. In order to understand the role of the elections in the Russian politics, you should ask a very simple question. Why President Putin, in 2004, is rigging the elections which he's going to win if they were free and fair? And most of people are going to basically agree back then that after the economic boom with the oil prices, after all this kind of disappointment with the 1990s, even the major opposition figures knew that he's going to win. Why then he's rigging the elections? And why he's rigging them in the way that everybody knows that they're rigged? So it was not a subtle kind of a story being done. And the major story is that rigged elections, which are not protested, because everybody knows that anyway he's going to win with the source of legitimacy of the Putin's regime. Because he used the elections to show first that there is no alternative. Secondly, to show the unity of the country. Because when you see 95% of Chechnya voting for him, all these people that figured that Russia can disintegrate in the way Soviet Union did, feel very much kind of relaxed. And thirdly, because on the presidential elections you're not electing a president, but you're changing governors. The governors who cannot bring people to vote are going to lose their positions. And all this worked till 2011, 2012, when people went on the streets to protest elections of being fraud. And this was the end of the Medvedev period. Uh, and the major uh, message of these people, and this was a middle class protest, it was Moscow and St. Petersburg. It was very much not about economic things, it was about dignity. They said, what you're doing to us? Two guys, Putin and Medvedev, drinking together and deciding who is going to be a president and who is going to be a prime minister. It cannot go like this. So dignity was the word. And then President Putin said, dignity? Okay, I'm going to return your dignity. And we're going to take Crimea. Because you cannot have a dignity in a country which is not treated in a dignified way. So the idea of imitation changed. We are not going to imitate Western institutions and values. We are going to imitate American foreign policy. And the major purpose is to delegitimize liberal order and to show that you are not better than us. I'm going to finish on this, but for me this is very important on the Russian side. There is one moment which, and there are people here who are doing a lot of foreign policy and others, which is not easy to explain. The president of the Russian Federation went on television and said that there were no Russian troops in Crimea. It's, he's not the first leader who is lying in history. The problem is that when you're lying, normally you expect that there is a certain room for deniability. But the problem with this statement was that it took hours for the Western leaders to know the names of the special troops that have been there. You are living in a quite transparent world. Why he's doing this? He was not hiding the truth. Lying could be a provocation. He lied in order to be called a liar and then to say a liar like you. What about the weapons for mass destruction in Iraq? He's also lying in order to show I'm lying, so what you can do? What you can do to me? And I do believe this type of a situation created also a very dangerous foreign policy dynamics because exposing the hypocrisy of the West became the major objective of the Russian foreign policy. By the way, this was the reason also why the Russians interfered in the American 
uh, domestic politics, from my point of view, I don't believe that Russians believe that Trump could become a president. Russians believed in the American deep state because they see other states in the way they see others, but interfering in the American domestic politics, which, by the way, started, according to Mueller report, in 2014, when Trump was not around at all, was to try to show their status as a great power. And for the Russians to be a great power means I can do to you what I do believe you're doing to me. The problem with this policy is that it's psychologically very justifying, but as a result of it, you're losing the idea of your strategic interest. You don't know anymore why you're doing this. You're doing this just to show to the Americans or to the Europeans certain things. This is why I find this type of a relationship much more dangerous when it comes to the accidents of history than a classical realpolitik in where people have a strategic interest, I want to occupy Warsaw, uh, or I want to do this and that, because you're all the time very much driven by mirroring others, and you're totally obsessed with <laughs> what others is doing is totally hypocrisy. There was a Western obsession with the former Gerasimov doctrine of the hybrid wars. But Gerasimov doctrine, according to Gerasimov himself, was not what the Russians should do, but what the Russians believe that we're doing to them, so they should also respond accordingly. And I do believe this was very important for us to show that, in a certain way, the major danger in the relations between the Russia and the West today come from the fact that it's not best on real politic what people are talking about. It's best on this kind of a mirroring others in order to erode and delegitimize the Western order. Mm. The, sorry. No, I mean, that, that the funny thing here is that the most bellicose Putin coincides in power with uh, the least aggressive American president ever, yeah. physically, I mean, not verbally. <laughs> you know, Trump has not invaded any country. He's, he, he's launched three missiles on, on Syria, but then has withdrawn. So, so, you know, the game has ended up in, as you say, in a place which is even, even all the bravados on Venezuela, which led the Russians to overreact, but then uh, they've discovered that the American, that Trump, you know, doesn't give a damn about Venezuela either. So, so I guess that the Russians are very puzzled themselves by the fact that, uh, that Trump is not playing along the script that they, uh, yeah. that they expected. But uh, one thing which, which you come in and out constantly on this, uh, and I think which is what makes Russia too similar to the U.S. or the U.S. too similar to Russia, and which is very worrying, is the place of truth. In, in public life and the destruction of truth, which you would expect in Russia with Putin, but it's, it's, more, it's even more massive compared to the standards when you look at the United States. And I think there is in the book, mm -hmm. your, your insights about, about Trump and truth and the place of truth in public life, it's, are, are even more depressing, <laughs> if I may say so, right? <laughs> I was in the United States the last year, most of the last year, because I have the Kissinger chair in the Library of the Congress. And it was quite interesting to talk to some of the people that voted for Trump. Because listen, being Bulgarian, I have been voting for different idiots all my life, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not moralizing on people how they're voting, believe me. <laughs> uh, but my question was always the following. Normally, the populist leaders have something very charming about their character. You either believe that he's very honest. For example, Kaczynski is not a corrupt person. Or you believe that he's very funny or something. The problem with President Trump is that he's quite mean. And this is mm -hmm. well known. So I was asking somebody, I said, listen, why you voted for a guy who is quite mean? And he said, listen, imagine that you should go to court and you don't trust the fairness of the judicial system. What kind of a lawyer are you going to hire? the most honest one or the nastiest one? He said, this is what we did. We like him exactly because of it. And one of the most destructive things that Trump did was that he was not simply lying. He's saying half-truths. For example, when you ask and tell his supporters, do you know, he's very economical with the truth. They said, yes, but he's not lying about the most important thing, that everything is about, his, about him and his interest, while all the other politicians pretend that it's about us. So the Trump position on truth is the following. Even when the Democrats are saying truth, this is for the same reasons I'm saying lies, because it works for them. 
The truth is not the value in itself. Mm -hmm. You're saying the truth only when it fits your interest. When it does not fit your interest, you're saying why. And if you go with this type of relations, I do believe that the world is really becoming a dangerous place. And for me, during the impeachment process, you can see particularly the American kind of a diplomats and people coming from the security sector. This is what they have been revolting against. They know that you cannot run out of it. Uh, as not you know, Fiona Hill is somebody who you know well, we have been friends. This is not the people that easily go against the president of the republic. So this is not the kind of, this is not the political, she's not a Democrat. But they basically understood that certain border was crossed. And strangely enough, for Trump, in order to cross this border, the reason is not simply that he's soft, but he is a person who does not believe in war in general. For him, the only war that exists is a trade wars. <laughs> he's a post-war president from this point. And by the way, when people compare him with Putin, it's totally wrong. For Putin, loyalty is the most important thing. He'll go to Syria in order to show, by the way, Putin does not like Assad personally, but it's not about Assad, it's about loyalty. My vassals can rely on me, and this is why they're my vassals. The problem with Trump is he said, people should be loyal to me, particularly when I'm wrong, but they should not expect loyalty from me, because this is the position of the most powerful. You don't need to be loyal to anybody. You're asking the Kurds to die for you, and then you're going to say, your problem is not my problem. And from this point of view, this is really very destabilizing beyond the personal relations and personal characteristics of one or the other leader. Yeah. Well. well, we could go on, because we still haven't covered half of this book, but uh, I think we take some questions from the floor. Good. There are many. Uh, do we have a mic? Yeah. Okay. Would you be so kind to stay, to give your name and thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Enrique Criado. I'm a career diplomat. My last posting was in Sofia until summer of 2018, so I would like to ask you a question about the country you know best. Um, as you were saying, Bulgaria in principle had all the ingredients to uh, uh, be part of that track of illiberalism in the sense that there is uh, nationalistic uh, sentiment in most of the population. The EU accession meant uh, emigration of part of the, of the population, many of them to Spain, by the way, um, angst about the future. And yet, uh, their government distanced itself from uh, Kaczynski, from Orban. They played the card of, uh, okay, while I could be one more Visegrad country, I will be loyal to, as it's conceived in, 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 in Sofia, loyal to Germany, loyal to Brussels. Uh, do you think this strategy has paid off uh, in, in that sense, like the, the strategy of being a good pupil and uh, distancing itself from uh, what could have been the normal trend? Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a very good question because uh, if you basically go and see exactly the opinion polls and even the profile of politicians, you can expect that Bulgaria is going to be somewhere between Hungary and Serbia in its foreign policy. But there are two important things that very much uh, three define Bulgarian policy. One is Bulgaria is genuinely insecure. We are on the border with Turkey, which these days is a highly inventive country. Uh, so, from this point of view, what the things that Mr. Orban can say, staying in the middle of Europe and being surrounded by Germany and the Czech Republic, Bulgarian leaders cannot afford. And also Bulgaria, also politically, has been squeezed between Turkey and Russia for a long period of time. So, from this point of view, I do believe it's also the character of the Prime Minister, who basically understood that for a country like Bulgaria playing this game, easily can end up with total self-isolation, total self-isolation. What you are going to forgive for Poland, for being big and strategically important, you are not going to forgive Bulgaria. And I do believe that the Bulgarian society is also feeling like this. Uh, uh, the, the policy toward Germany is also has history, the famous maxim for every diplomat coming to Bulgaria. Nevertheless, to whom he talks about our leaders, they're always going to quote the famous phrase that the Bulgarian foreign policy has 
being guided by one principle, always with Germany, never against Russia. Uh, but it was not easy, basically, to reconcile this over the 20th century. <laughs> Yes, my name is Pedro Rodriguez. I lecture and write about international relations. And my question, I see in your book that you take very seriously Donald Trump. You don't think he's a grotesque figure or a joke or a misunderstanding. Uh, I would like to know right now in between the impeachment and the primaries, if you can assess how much damage has been done by his administration. Okay, uh, the, the, thank you for the question, it's an important question. We took Donald Trump much more seriously than most of the people. Because why it's so difficult for any type of an intellectual to take Trump seriously is because he's totally anti-intellectual. But the fact that somebody does not read books does not mean that there is no consistency at all. He had an instinct, and this instinct is quite strong, and in a certain paradoxical way of his own, he's quite consistent. What I find is a major change coming from Trump, and this is something that is going to affect, in my view, European foreign policy, nevertheless, of what's going to happen on the next elections, and is that for the first time, we know that the change of government and president in the United States can mean the change of a regime. Imagine that if you're a European politician, even if you can hope that on these elections, a very friendly to Europe Democrat could be elected, I don't know who he is, but imagine we never can be sure that in four years, somebody like Trump will not come again. So what was very important for the transatlantic relations was that we liked more of some presidents and like less others, but there was a very strong predictability and American foreign policy was not based on who goes in the White House. So there was a certain foreign policy consensus which was bipartisan, which was supported by institutions, and Trump destroyed it or showed that it is not existing anymore. Secondly, what is interesting about President Trump is that paradoxically, for him, the civil war within the United States is more important than any existential threat from outside. I do believe that for me, and I do believe for many, the biggest impact had the fact that when the Democrats attacked Trump for the Russian connections, they expected that the Republican voters, quote, the whole Cold War basically have been socialized to be very skeptical to Russia, put it mildly, are going to distance from him. Instead of this, the Republican voters basically started to like President Putin. So, from this point of view, you have a story in which, on the level of the population, this type of a consensus is destroyed. And to the extent that Europe so much depends on the American security guarantees, in my view, this is a game changer. And I don't believe that the world is going to go back the way it was, even if President Trump is going to be defeated, even if Brexit is going to be defeated. So from this point of view, for us, it was a transformative change. It does not need that, by the way, I never believe that the world is going to be, the future is to Trump or this or that. But simply, there was a point of rupture, which is very important and in many ways could be as important as was uh, basically 30 years ago. We are in a new world. And for me, this was very important to recognize it. Because in Europe, there are many people who believe that when Trump is gone, everything is going to change. But it's not going to come back. And I could be wrong. I hope to be wrong. Uh, it, it might believe I'm a much more traditional kind of a 1990s liberal than you're going to believe when you read the book. But my argument always was with these people who believe that if we can show resilience and support status quo for one or two more years, everything is going to be fine. Hello, thank you. My name is Mercedes Tamburi. I work in Technosophia. And I wanted to ask you, Ivan, a question about Bulgaria, because I think there is something very interesting and peculiar about Bulgaria. It was the only country who did not report their Jews and who saved them, a very heroically and a very cohesive society. Can you tell something about this? 
No, listen, saving of the Bulgarian Jews is one of the best things that we have done. It was also a very strange coalition of actors that did it. Uh, and, but, so, let to be fair and honest, we didn't save everybody. We saved the Jews on the territory of Bulgaria. In the occupied territories, the territories that have been occupied by the Bulgarian army, in Macedonia, 4, 14,000 Jews have been sent to the death camp and have been destroyed. But the interesting story about uh, saving of the Jews was that this was really a coalition. First of all, on the local level, there were people coming and defending and basically opposing the anti-Jewish legislation. So this is why uh, one of the very important figure, uh, one of the members of parliament for the governing party, the deputy speaker of the parliament, Mr. Peshev, basically was very much pushed by his own constituencies to stay for the Jews. You have Bulgarian Orthodox Church, which took a very, in my view, unexpected position and defended the Bulgarian Jews. You have the king and you have the Communist Party. How Bulgarians saved the Jews? Also in a very Bulgarian way. We never did anything heroic. We didn't say we're going to save the Jews. When the Germans are telling us, give us the Jews, we are going to say for sure, but we cannot do it today. Could we do it tomorrow? <laughs> no, but this is very important because in a certain way, uh, uh, you can see a society that uh, was simply not accepting this because the Bulgarian Jews were perceived very much as being part of the Bulgarian society. And also, and this is very important for this period, something that I was also believe particularly shocking uh, for, the, for the German Jews. Most of these Bulgarian Jews have been in the Bulgarian army during the World War I, during the Balkan Wars. So they have been shown they're belonging to the Bulgarian community, basically dying for Bulgaria. So they have all the reasons to say, listen, we are part of you. And society did it. There is one less honorable explanation, which I'm going to say halfly, seriously, halfly joking. Normally, you cannot hate too many people at the same time. <laughs> and Bulgarian obsession, historically, have been with Turkey. Because of the Ottoman Empire, basically Polish relations to Russia. Uh, this has changed, by the way, also, incredibly. In the, uh, in the modern Bulgaria, you don't have this uh, very strong anti-Turkish sentiments. But just to imagine how strong was uh, the anti-Turkish sentiment in the 1970s, one of the Angola uh, guerrilla leaders uh, took a three years military academy in Bulgaria. And when he came back, he became a general in the army, and in front of the troops, the president of the republic asked him, and now comrade this and this is coming back from Bulgaria, and he's going to tell us who is the enemy number one for Angola. And the answer was, for sure, Turkey. <laughs> there is another question over there. Hi, my name is Victorino Marquez. I am a Venezuelan attorney. Uh, you know, there's this belief that as Russia is a, like a second-rate world power, they didn't have the power to destabilize the world order, as, as you said. But I, I believe that they have proven quite successful uh, on that. And, and, and you know, if you, if you think about Cuba, which is like quite a, a poor country, I mean, they have also like, in some ways, especially in the past, undermined a liberal democracy in, in, in Latin America. And, and, you know, I'm trying to think about what do you think is Russia's role in, in Latin America? Because clearly, in the case of China, it's a commercial interest and, and they want to expand their business network. But in the case of Russia, you know, there has been like some talk about Putin trying to threat American interests in, 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 in South America. Now we are seeing that this so it's a kind of wave in which you have Chile, you have, uh, um, you have also Colombia, in which you have riots, and, and probably there is some talk that Foro de Sao Paulo is behind some of these demonstrations, although Foro de Sao Paulo encompasses like leftist democracies and authoritarian left in, in Venezuela. But what I'm trying to, to find out is what do you think is Putin's ambition in, in Latin America, and in particularly with this uh, kind of, of uh, um, pulso. How do you say pulso? Yeah. yeah. Pulse. Yeah. <laughs> Pulse with uh, uh, the US in, in Venezuela. I'm going to try to answer you. I, don't, I have never been particularly 
researching Latin America, I know slightly more about Africa. But this is one of the effects. First of all, we should make a distinction between the Putin effect and the Russia effect. There is a major Putin effect in the world. There is admiration with Putin. With Russia, people don't know much. And Russia basically has its own problem, economic, demographic, and so on. Uh, the interesting story is what Russia learned is that with a very small political interference here and there, you can get relevance. But the second thing that is happening is that the Western media made Russia to look much more powerful than it is. I was reading Anna Applebaum has this study about uh, basically the disinformation uh, uh, flows during the previous parliamentary elections in Spain. And it appeared that some of the American evangelical groups were more active in supporting Vox than assumed basically uh, the, Russian, uh, the Russian agents. Russia now is also totally benefiting from the fact that it is perceived as very powerful. For example, in Africa, Russia does not have financial resources. So Chinese gold is a big money. But what Russia has, and don't forget, this was a country that used to have a global network. There was a communist party all over. There have been people that have been studying in Russia that they speak the language. So from this point of view, you can go and just send, sending political consultants for one leader or really coming with some of this kind of a, uh, information strategy you're becoming relevant. To be honest, you even don't know why you're doing this. You does not need that you know what you want. Venezuela is slightly more easy case, but if you're going to ask me Colombia, but then you are on the table, and on this table you can trade off different things. And I do believe that being globally relevant is the major strategy of the Russian federations to places like Latin America, Africa, where, with the exception of the certain countries, uh, there is not much to be done. And secondly, what is happening in Russia is that they are very much allowing private initiative when it comes to the foreign policy. Uh, it's not simply that you have basically the Wagner Group and others which are well known, but also, if I'm a Russian business person with a certain connections to Colombia, I'll be very much become entrepreneurial also on the political level uh, and trying to play this because first it plays well at home, but secondly, one of the major interests also of the Russians, to be honest, it's one of the big arms exporters, is also selling arms. In Africa, selling arms is one of the things that basically have been achieved. Uh, I do believe also we're slightly over-strategizing Russia. I was, uh, some years ago, I was talking to somebody who used to be the head of the presidential administration in the early period of uh, President Putin, and because there was a problem in Bulgaria, there was a Russian business person uh, uh, trying to buy a television. They were supporting a very far-right party in Bulgaria. So I said, why are you doing this? I said, Bulgaria normally is a Russia-friendly country. You have some of the major parties very supportive for you. Why you basically put money in this very marginal, extreme party? Does it mean that you want to have people on the streets? This is how we should read it. And he looked to me and he said, I do believe he was right. And he said, Ivan, you're over-strategizing us. We're a country in isolation. We're giving money to everybody who is ready to take money from us. And he said, it's not a big money. And what I'm saying this, strangely enough, what is happening with Russia is now when they re-emerge as a power center, you have a demand for Russian money, for Russian influence. It's not that the Russians go to this Colombian politician. This Colombian politician go to Moscow or go to people that can go to Moscow and said, can we do something together? Uh, so as a result of it, you have a multi of the Russian influence, and part of it, uh, I do believe this idea of an overpowerful Russia is also very much uh, strengthened by the Western media. I have a column with the New York Times. I was talking to them all the time. I said, if Putin is as powerful and if he can decide the American election, if you're right, we simply should not have elections in Bulgaria anymore. Because if, you, if he can elect the American president, Electing Bulgarian president should come basically as a dessert. <laughs> How about um, Russia and China getting together? I mean, on the basis you, my enemy uh, and your enemy, so if they are the same, we are friends. You know, this was a big debate, particularly in the American foreign policy community, and for years I was mm -hmm. 
listening to very sophisticated arguments why China and Russia cannot go together because of the major exposure of Russia with totally underpopulated uh, areas in Siberia and others. I'm not buying this, to be honest. For, first of all, President Putin perceived European Union particularly as a challenge and threat to Russia's political and cultural identity. And at the same time, I do believe that Russia and China went much closer than we expected. And keeping in mind that probably the next dividing line is going to be a technological one, uh, I do believe that if in one or two years we see Russia moving very much on the Chinese technologies and Chinese hardware and so on, this closing and this kind of a warming up between Russia and China could be much more stable than many of uh, people believed. And from this point of view, theoretically, President Trump could have been right when he believed that he can cite and take Russia on his side against China. But in my view, this was based on a analytical mistakes of the nature of the Russia-China relations. The idea that we are easily going, and President Macron has the same, in my view, uh, kind of fantasy, that we are easily going to convince Russia to side with us against the Chinese. Uh, it's not easily, and when you talk to the Russians, they said something which is also not true, but which is going to show where their imagination go. When you push them and said, listen, in this relationship, you are inferior, you are basically a junior partner. They said yes and no. Our relations with China are like the relations between Germany and France. Germany, of course, is much more economically powerful, but they do not have the strategic culture. While we, particularly when it comes to the military side, have much more power projections, we are much more ready to act, to do this and that. Of course, this is a very much kind of a self-flattering image of the nature of the relationship, and I'm not sure that this is exactly how it looked from Beijing. Uh, but at least for the moment, uh, I don't see it. And uh, this is the last, but for me this was important. If you go to Moscow today and start to talk to the younger generation of experts, those closer to the government and those very critical to the government. The thing that really worries me is that their best people are not doing Europe and the United States anymore. They're doing China. They're doing, by the way, the Arab world. They're doing India. The most gifted, they go for difficult languages, for difficult careers. And those who have been doing career on the Europe and the United States, now they're the most bitter ones because they believe that we destroyed their careers. So from this point... <laughs> Well, is there... Oh, wonderful. Yeah, and it's um, uh, yes, yeah, second. Uh, just, just, uh, just a moment. We, we will use... Sorry, I'm a journalist. Yeah. I happened to cover the dissolution of the Soviet Union at the time. Um, you uh, associated uh, Putin with revenge. Revenge? Uh, uh, revenge, yes, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, when uh, he is repeating all the time that the dissolution of the Soviet Union is... Um, uh, like the kind of dissolution of the European Union now, uh, this uh, uh, concept plus the revenge element and the visits of all these uh, Western politicians, the Italians, the, yeah. the French, to the Kremlin, do you think that it's just a, a theoretical thing or is playing hard? And what's the meaning of the card of revenge in this game? Thank you. Listen, this is, in my view, a great question because I, for myself, did my best to understand what is the Russia strategy towards the European Union? Because you can have three totally different reasonable strategies. One is basically divorcing Europe from the United States, but keeping European unity, which from economic, but also strategical point of view, is the best that can come to Russia when you talk to strategic interest. The other is basically just trying to divide European Union, and the third is trying to marginalize the East European countries, not all of them, but particularly Poland and the Baltics, which are perceived as the core of the anti-Russian sentiment. I don't believe that there is a consensus in the Russian foreign policy, including in the presidential administration, what they're doing. There was a moment in which they believed in the rise of the populists and nationalists. And then I don't believe that they are very clear now how it's going to go on, but psychologically, for the generation of President Putin, which is not necessarily true for the younger generation, they believe that the European Union is going to disintegrate because all their thinking is very much shaped by the disintegration of the Soviet Union. And for them, why European Union should survive if we collapsed? 
I'm not going to call this strategy. I want to be fair to the Russians. I, I don't believe that basically they know exactly what they're doing, but as a result of it, they're ready to engage. And by the way, not on ideological level. When people said, oh, Russia is the leader of European conservatism. Have you heard Mr. Putin talking badly about the Muslims? He will not do it. 20% of the population of the Russian Federation are Muslims. Every fourth person on the military age is coming from the Muslim family. So from this point, you think that Mr. Salvini could say and others, you're never going to hear from Putin. Of course, he's going to talk that liberalism is obsolete and so on and so on. But he's not a typical populist leader. He's not coming from the street. He's coming from security services, which is one of the most institutionalized things. People who are very careful how they're speaking, to whom they're speaking, and so on. So from this point of view, I do believe that the Russians are going to be highly opportunistic. They're going to see what we're going to do to ourselves. So if European Union is going to do fine, they're going to accept this reality. If basically they had the feeling that we are going around the drill, they're going to help us to finish it. <laughs> there is one question over there. Thank you. If uh, I may, uh, a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is, uh, I found, uh, I, I'm sorry, my name is Miguel Angel Navarro, former diplomat. So I, um, I found a similarity between the attitude of the uh, uh, country state, uh, member states like uh, Spain, Portugal, and the new member states from Eastern uh, Europe. Um, we both found in the very first years we, we, we were frustrated because uh, despite that we were maintaining positions, rationalizing these positions and so on, we were barely heard at the European Union. That's part of the treatment you give the newcomer. But uh, things change, unlike, in my opinion, what has happened in the uh, newer member states. And what happened? What, what happened was leadership, and um, the other thing was a pro-European pro stance. I would even say an avant-garde European stance. And the example is the structural funds. When we <clears throat> got into the Union, structural fund was a marginal expenditure, and uh, after a few years it became the second expenditure in amount uh, after the common agricultural policy. What happened then? Well, we had Felipe González. Felipe González was a charismatic leader, but he was a respected leader and a friend of the other European leaders, and that helped this process. This is something I haven't found so far in Eastern Europe. You had the charismatic leaders, but this generation has already passed, and now maybe this is And now comes my question to what extent liberal democracies are not respond, responsible for uh, guaranteeing a uh, good transition in terms of leadership. I think liberal democracy can hardly maintain its values, principle, and especially convincing people if they're not capable of producing better leaders. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm going to very much agree with you, and this is not simply about liberal democracy, it's also particularly true about Europe and European Union. We convinced ourselves that we have created a system in which the institutions are so strong, and they are so sophisticatedly designed, that nevertheless, who is going to be at the top, it's going to function well. And in a certain way, this was a European dream, because don't forget that they are important European language, in which the word leader does not have an easy translation. They're not going to like the translation. I mean German, you don't want the, this to be translated. So from this point of view also what uh, I always, and we had this talk with uh, a very respected uh, by me, German policy intellectual Thomas Bagger, who said, the end of history was an American idea, but a German reality. Because this was the world in which you don't need leaders anymore. You need managers of the historical processes. 
it's about competence, it's about process. Political leadership was totally kind of a marginal. There was even kind of a jokes about countries that believe in political leaders. But I very much agree with you. I do believe that leadership matters. And from this point of view, the leaders does not need to be perfect, but they should take stands. Uh, and Eastern Europe, this is the other story. The major story now is not that we do not have an anti-populist voters. What Eastern Europe is looking for is the new generation of liberal leaders. What do I talk about Slovakia? Personally, I have a huge respect for Tusk, and I do believe that he also, as a leader of the European Union, achieved a lot. But it's not easy, because it's not abstract, because also you're risking. <laughs> for example, there was the local elections in Hungary, in which there was a new mayor of Budapest from the opposition being elected. He was elected on protest vote, but it is also that he allowed the people to vote for him. He was charismatic enough, he was sympathetic enough, people trusted him. And I do believe that something that happened in European politics, particularly in Brussels, and I'm not a great expert on Brussels, is that leaders started to be, even the way we're making commissions and so on, this is a trade in which the personality basically is disappearing. You are just trading affiliations, gender, certain type of a closeness, uh, you are not really having a substantial talk about the quality of these very persons to do this and that. And from this point of view, also on your uh, point important on uh, funds, President Putin three days ago gave an interview in which he said that he expects that around 2028, 2030s, uh, European Union to start disintegrating because East European countries, which at this moment will stop getting money uh, from the European Union, I will have no reason to stay anymore. By the way, this is totally misunderstanding of the East European positions. Even people like Mr. Orban and Mr. Kaczynski will insist staying in the European Union even in the absence of money. But why he believes it? Because many in the Western Europe talk about East simply in money terms. If we're going to punish them for breaking the rule of law simply on money level, this is going to be enough. And I do believe how to find a language to talk which is not simply the money language could be, yeah, could be good. Well, uh, our compromise is to finish at half past eight. So if there are no more questions, uh, there is, so there are two questions. Can we uh, prolong that? <laughs> I mean, organizers, can we have two more questions, please? Lovely. Thank, Thank you very much. Guillaume Gestoso, very briefly, how about a word be, uh, about the relationship between Emmanuel Macron, so probably the quintessentially liberal leader today, and Vladimir Putin. Thank you. I do believe that President Macron is trying to come with a strategy for European sovereignty based on the idea of the normalization relations with Russia. He treats Putin as a classical realpolitik politician because what he knows best about Putin is Russia and Syria. I do believe he's underestimating the sentimental part of the Russian foreign policy when it comes to the EU. So I can see a relationship that on one level there are going to be initial attractions. It's not going to be easy. Uh, in many places you have two ambitious leaders. Both of them have a much control of the foreign policy on their countries. Uh, but I do believe that paradoxically he also sees slightly the Russia which traditionally existed in the geopolitical imagination of the French foreign policy, which is not necessarily what you have now. So I will not be surprised if President Macron gets disappointed, particularly if he tries to make the policy with respect to Russia not talking to the Poles, not talking to the Baltics, because this can become a very much dividing line within the European Union. Germans were not bad at doing this. What people don't understand, that during the Ukrainian crisis, what Steinmeier and Merkel have been doing, it was not their Ukrainian policy. This was their Polish policy. They managed to convince the Poles that for the German, Poland is more important than Russia. And this is kind of something that Poles in general were not easy to believe. And I do believe that during the Tusk government, it worked well. The problem is that the next government had such a strong historical bias against Germany that in a certain way it appeared that German investment <laughs> didn't pay back. Thank you. Yeah, well, there is just one more. This is the last question, okay? If 
Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, I would like uh, to pose a question um, on a subject which I think is very little discussed, but I would, you know, I'm actually very interested, you know, in the position of the countries which are south to Russia, you know, and at the same time close to China, such as, for instance, Uzbekistan or Azerbaijan, uh, because, you know, the Silk and Road Belt, you know, is going, is going to pass through them, and at the same time, you know, these countries that used to pertain to the Soviet Union. So I'm just very curious, you know, yeah. what would be your view on the f possible future evolution? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. It's a very interesting question. There are people that know much more than me on this, but one of the interesting stories, there was a major expectation that Russia and China are going to clash, particularly in Central Asia, where the economic influence of China was rising, but they made, in my view, quite uh, a reasonable compromise in which Russia remains the major security provider, and basically China is getting a lot of economic investments and benefits. What is interesting is for the first time in some of these countries, you can see anti-China sentiments. Uh, there was a protest, there was stories. So I do believe that these countries will try to balance between Russia and China. They will try basically to diversify their policies because the level of sovereignty that they can get is on this level. Uh, but the Russians managed to agree with the Chinese that one belt, one road policy that goes through the Central Asia is going to be coordinated also with the Eurasian Economic Union and basically Russia's interests. For how long this is going to be, I don't know. The key country, of course, is Kazakhstan. And for Russia, Kazakhstan is critically important in many aspects. Strategic, in many aspects. Uh, never forget that when the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia was interested in the optimal union. And for them, the optimal union were four countries, Belarus, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. Uh, so from this point, the Central Asian countries did not leave the Soviet Union. They were expelled by the Soviet Union because it was the Russian Federation that initiated the disintegration of this part. Baltic republics ran away, but to be honest, they have not been very much there. Uh, so from this point of view, I do believe that the relations between China and Russia, for the moment, are controlled and managed, they're managed on the highest level, but of course what is going to be the behavior of the Uzbekistan government, or Turkmenistan government and others, uh, is going to be critically important, and particularly if you end up with the Russian party and China party in the elites. If you go on this type of a divide, then the tensions can rise. But as I told you, Central Asia is not something that I know well enough, so put this in a footnote and ask somebody who knows the major text. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everyone uh, in, uh, on the floor who took, um, uh, took uh, interest in this lecture, well, in this conversation. It was also a lecture. Mm -hmm. At the end, we ended up with a lecture on many interesting issues. Uh, if I may say, I would, uh, I, I would like to behave like the mother of Kipling. Uh, you know, the book, the last page, explains who, the importance of the mother of, Kim, of Kipling for the title, the, the light that failed. The first book of Kipling, it was a tragic love story, and uh, it was ending tragically, of course, but the mother of Kipling said, look, I, I prefer an optimist ending. So I'm like the mother of uh, of Kipling. I would say that this light should never really fail. This is the best system for protecting our rights and our liberties. And the only thing is that it really depends very much on the quality of our leadership. We need leaders who are statesmen, and we need also citizens who behave as such, and not as, as you say at one point, fans of a football club. So, on this optimistic note, I would like to close uh, today's evening and thank you very much, um, Ivan and thank Nacho much. and, and thank everybody. Thank you very much for thank both you. of you. Thank you. Thank you.